Stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are costume designer Jacqueline St. Anne and architect Susan Narduli. Jacqueline St. Anne is an Emmy Award winning costume designer who was born in Panama and educated in a number of schools in Europe and the United States. She graduated from the University of Arkansas in Little Rock, earned a master's, uh, her master's from the Ring Theater at the University of Miami. Jacqueline has designed costumes for films, print, commercials, video, TV, ballet, opera, and the theater. You run the gamut. <laughs> She's taught classes at SUNY, International Fine Arts College in Miami, and lectured at our local universities, including UCLA and USC. We mentioned a list of different design uh, groups that you've worked for. Did you actually do the costumes for all of those, uh, like commercials and print ads, or do you get uh, vintage clothes to be a part of it, or how do you do all of that designing? Each project has its own imperative, so if it were to be a period picture, we would make certain things for the leading actors and we would rent costumes for the background or the secondary characters. Sometimes the leading actors' costumes are either completely or partially rented, but vintage is um, not that available. Oh, so, what, so it, would you get a photograph of something from that period and then make it? It depends on... Well, our, we use primary sources as best we can, which would be to go to museums and look oh, at paintings of people from the period. And then secondary sources would be a picture of the painting. And then, uh, well, actually, the, the original might be a garment mm -hmm. in a museum. So that would be the, the first, the second, primary, secondary, and tertiary costume uh, sources. So, it, you know, you go to... <clears throat> the earliest source you can for the most authenticity. Do you sew yourself? I actually, I, I can, but... In, <laughs> Do you? Because sometimes you can't, right? I'm actually not um, authorized to do that in a union film because we that would be the job of, I have a cutter fitter oh. who makes a pattern for me from the costume that I design. And uh, then it's, for instance, this was made at Paramount. So this is this design is something that you drew up and designed. And then someone comes in. I had a cutter fitter who made the pattern for me. And of course, I selected the fabrics. And uh, I made 12 of everything. Oh, I was going to ask you about that. 12. Yeah. This was a very pippy long stock. It was a very big action picture. You wouldn't think of it in terms of, there are no bullet hits, but it's a so big was, action picture. So it was a motion picture yes. film? Yes. I mean, she was flown. She had a, uh, she had a, um, a swimming double. She had an acrobatic double. Oh. She had um, a stunt double Here, and a photo on, double. She's on a horse? Yes. And, um, the, and what's this fabric on this? this that's uh, a chiffon. And it's like flowing as she's... Writing, moving. Kind of. It's fantastic. It's the way we used to play dress up when you would put <laughs> your mother's dress over your clothes. And that's that was the image, the 50s dress up. So when you character. think about those things, you're talking about that, uh, a, a stunt double or a, a swimming double or a, somebody riding the horse, do you think about how the clothes are going to move or what's going to happen to them before you design them? Well, of course, you know, we're very, very, very 
married to our script. And oh, the I script see. is the uh, pattern for a d the designer. This is the story we have to tell, and every aspect of the costume helps in telling the story, whether it flows, whether it's stiff, mm. uh, whether it rips when somebody tries to climb over a, a fence, and that's either part of a character or it's not. So you want to make, design for the, the needs of the character and tell the story. With all the travel that you did, because mm -hmm. your father was in the Air Force, right? Yes. And with all the different schools you went to, was it your dream to be in entertainment? Was it your dream to do this? Did you sit in your room and sketch <laughs> all the time? <laughs> Actually, I was encouraged into the medical field by a family oh. that was very, very traditional. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think I caused them a great deal of disappointment. So you were doing surgeries in your room instead of drawing costumes? Well, no, I was in my room, I was drawing the costumes. But uh, when they were watching, I was <laughs> playing with my dissection kit. But my mother was an entertainer, and uh, I think that that was part of the family. <laughs> uh, yeah. Let's go, go to the operas that you designed at the Bing. Were those full operas? Yes, yes. They were. were and yes. that, that's the Bing Theater? I've done 10 operas uh, at, uh, with the, um, the school there. And uh, you, of course, you've met Timur Babesnikov, who's wonderful Russian. Or yes, he's Yes, uh, yes. Singer. And you designed clothes for him? Yes. I've designed costumes for him. I've never actually designed clothes. And of oh. course, we make a big. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, costumes, right? <laughs> but he wore it. He wore it on the show here, and it looked like part of his wardrobe. <laughs> well, that is part of his character too. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Yes, he's pretty fabulous. So, um, how did you do that? Design the costumes. Yes, for the operas, you did many operas. Yes, um, and I last year I did the Chicago Opera Theater, and I also did uh, the Long Beach Theater. Ah. We did um, uh, Leon Janicek, which is a Czechoslovakian opera, and uh, did it in English, and it was called The Cunning Little Vixen. I know, that's such a great opera. It is a great the, opera. And you have to, uh, you actually have to design animal clothes, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and of course, the, the requirements for the actors, I mean, the, the opera singers, is that they be able to sing and hear and see. Oh, so here, because I did, if you're an animal, you can't hear maybe, right? Well, you, you can't put anything that. over their ears. Ah. So they have to, uh, I wish I'd brought you some pictures from those. But uh, those animal costumes had to be opera friendly for my singers so ah. that they can hear the uh, orchestra and they can see the conductor. It's very important. And then, of course, that they produce sound. Right, so, so you have to know the opera really well obviously. And then do you work with the director too? The director, and, and particularly the director that I've been working with um, recently, and who is the premier teacher of acting to singers, is very physical. And so his actors and the action of these operas are unlike anything you've seen recently. And these are very, very active really? events. Yes, they're very... Uh, exciting to watch. What so. is his name? His name is Ken Kazan and he's currently at Central City Opera doing not Death in Venice. Can't remember. But what when when you work with him and you say it's very physical you have to also then make cl clothes for them to be able to move in, right? Is that the what you're saying? Costumes have to accommodate the uh, singer's abilities and, and, and what the action of the story. The challenge Absolutely. would be to get them moving around. Um, you've done a lot of TV, a lot of yes. Columbo's, right? I did 26 movies with is the this inimitable something Peter Falk. From there? Yes, this is a design I did for Faye Dunaway. She won an Emmy for this Columbo, the first Emmy that she had won. It's beautiful dress. And Thank you. It was just lovely. And <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. It looks great. Working with Peter is a treat. He's a very creative man. I'm going to show um, this because he creative is the word, right? He's an artist in his own right. This is a, a, a drawing of Peter that he did himself. I include it because I have done this costume and made this costume for him over and over again. Is it? Is it do you have to make that? that 
what is it? The trench Rain coat. coat? The oh, trench yes. coat? I have about six of them. Oh, <laughs> so that, that's really a special rumpled one? I make, the I, from the suits, uh, I buy the fabric and I wash it for about a year. Is that and right? And then after that, then I cut it into a costume, cut it into a suit, and uh, beat it up some more. And then, do you make his slacks? Do you make all of that? A stuff? suit. The and, suit? And, yeah, trousers. The yeah. whole thing. And the and, ties. And this is a photograph of him, not his drawing, which he did right. of himself, but his a photograph. And who's the mermaid? I'm very sorry to tell you that I can't remember her name. She was a lovely actress. And uh, she's wearing a harness and flying in the mermaid costume. And then we photographed her and through CGI, put her into an aquarium. Oh, how great. So you made her tail? I did. <laughs> <laughs> so when you work on a TV uh, show <clears throat> like that, you're costuming everybody on the show? Oh, yes. Because we, and we create a palette, and it's very important. And I have my own palette for different kinds of shows. But it's very important that everything be part of that. And when we talk about a palette, is it just a color we're talking about, or is it like fabrics and, um, I don't know, d different color fabrics? Do things work together? Tell us a little Absolutely. bit. Absolutely. Well, the colors, uh, I think it's, it's very, very much more acceptable to the eye and easy for the audience to understand if you restrict the palette somewhat and, and eliminate colors. Oh, I, I mean, see. sometimes, well, the very first opera I did for uh, the Bing Theater, I eliminated the color black, which is a very common color, and I only used navies. navies so that was and your choice. That was your idea to eliminate black, and why? Because it draws your eye so much. Well, I wanted the I wanted to, it to have more elegance and life, and so I used navy blue, and it had a it had a kick, and it had a. A depth, a, hue a and different kind of depth, doesn't it? <clears throat> kind yes. of like you can go into it. And it was very much more exciting with the silver than black ah. was. So you do, so you come up with the concept, you come up with the palette. Mm -hmm. um, the last one I did was in red, all oh. red, with accents of black and white. And it, when the nuns were on stage and they were white, it was, had a very calming feeling. And when the chorus appeared, all in red, This is colors. the opera we're talking about. This is the Wagner that I just finished. And uh, when the red flooded the stage, it was a very energizing feeling, and you could hear it throughout the audience. That they were startled when they saw it. It just yes. like, mm -hmm. that's what's so great. But it's difficult to work. I mean, it seems like your bread and butter would be in TV. Not in an opera that runs four times, but takes probably five <laughs> times more of your time. Well, I think I did, I, this is my 40th year designing costumes. I got a master's in 1970, and here we are in 2010. And for about the first t five or ten years, I was in theater, and then I started doing films. Did you start interning with people so you could learn? No, I, and I regret never having been an assistant, although I created my own, <laughs> my own uh, ideas and my own career and my own path. So without anyone's influence, really, the inf not another designer's influence. Right, I see, I see. And I wish sometimes that I had assisted because... Uh, it's pretty interesting, isn't it? Yes. And, and then you also work <clears throat> with great designers that you can go back and actually perpetuate or tell stories about what they did, which I think is always so good. It would have been great to have had a mentor. Before we leave, just tell us a little bit about this. Oh, this is The Munsters, a <laughs> television movie we did for, for The Munsters. And uh, Veronica Hamill played Lily, Lily Munster. And that she's wearing a stole, which is actually a skunk. And I, um, I uh, spray painted the uh, the face of the skunk, so he's quite frightening. <laughs> it's perfect. And this yeah. is the photograph of one. Of Actually, if you turn that the other way up, oh, you will sorry. see a picture. There we are. There you go. A okay. velvet suit. <laughs> that is the werewolf, the sun. Yes, and uh, he's wearing a sort of a little Lord Fauntleroy suit in 
velvet. Those are so great, and the ties always look so wonderful. I'm not particularly nice with werewolf ears. Yes, I well, think, I think you? well, you have to look at the costume. You have to your costume has to go along with the makeup too, doesn't it? That's very important because and and in in the theater and in opera, of course, the costume designer creates the makeup and the ah, hair as yes. well. We so you have control. Mm -hmm. You have control yes. over the wigs and the makeup. Yeah. But not the scenery. No. <laughs> it's the production designer. Unless, of course, you're also designing the scenery, During which both, sometimes huh? uh, a designer will be hired to do both. Well, yeah. I'm so glad you came on today. Thank you so much for having me, Joan. It was great, and it was so interesting to know how much you have to do when you actually <laughs> take on a project. Well, we always think it's how much we get to do. How much you get to do. That's yeah. great. Thank you. So nice to finally meet you. And don't go away. We'll be right back with architect Susan Narduli. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm with architect Susan Narduli, who was born and raised in New York. She attended Syracuse University, earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Sculpture at Cal State Long Beach, then her Master of Architecture at UCLA, and Susan was a project designer for Frank Gehry's firm then went on to start Narduli Studio in 1991, um, where for several years she partnered with Elise Grinstein, our dear friend. Her firm now bridges the discipline of art and architecture. You're going to have to tell us about that <laughs> because it's, it's uh, something that's very interesting. She's won lots of awards, which we'll talk about. But first, how did you get involved in sculpture? You know, that's a good question. I was a psychology major when I started school. You're kidding. And I, <laughs> you and, were? I, and I was supporting myself as a waitress. And a friend of mine that I met said, you know, you're really not going to be a good psychologist. I think you should look into art. And, um, <laughs> and, and she was a printmaker. And so I just, I, at the time, I, I was living in California, and I was going to UCLA undergraduate. And uh, I had already left Syracuse. It took me about 10 years to get my undergraduate degree. I was one of those people that kind of wove through all the different schools. And, and so I started taking art classes at UCLA. And I oh, loved you it. Did? She was right. You, mm -hmm. you took at UCLA art mm -hmm. classes. And who For a while. was there? You know, at the time, it was an undergraduate program. And uh. um, I was there for a year. And then um, I wanted to. Really, UCLA was very theoretical, and I wanted to make things. I wanted to learn how to make things, and so then I, I transferred to Long Beach so that um, I could cast metal. They had a foundry there. They have a great art school, though, they don't do. they? They do, and it's very, it was very hands-on, and, and I learned, and it was so exciting. I learned how to, how to, how to cast bronze. Oh, so that was your forte as far as sculpture went. It, it started that way, and then I was thinking ceramics for some idea. I don't yeah. know why it wasn't. No, it started actually started figurative work, um, and um, casting bronze. I was very involved with the process, and then I dropped out of that school for a while and started my own foundry. And I I supported myself for a while casting other people's sculptures because that's really important. Artists can't cast their work, can they? They need someone who's artistic and also has the, the well, stamina, yes, but also the artistic physical. quality mm -hmm. to be able to cast their work. Right. That's really interesting, and there aren't very many really good foundries. There aren't, and in fact, there are a few less now than when I was doing it. And where um, was that foundry? Here? In well, LA? I, had, I, I started, I trained at Sun Foundry, which was an art foundry for many years, and um, when I, it started in Long Beach, and then it was in Glendale. And then I worked out of another foundry in Santa Ana. Oh, so they're all on the outskirts yeah, of the city. Yeah, they're kind of hidden. So um, 
I, I think that's actually what led me into the path I chose because it is such physical work and I found myself spending all my time casting other people's work and not doing my work. <laughs> right. So I went back to Long Beach and by the time that I got there they had this new media program and they had Rachel Rosenthal and Sherry Galke and Rita Ikai. They're all teaching there. It was everything, it, it was everything but object. Very cutting edge. Yes. Very Ve a aesthetic. And and performance art, installation art, um, art is food. It was everything everything but what I had been doing, which was making these things. Well, it was uh, totally different from what we looked at as art, or right. what we were thinking of as exactly. art. It was like a new invention. Right. So then? I got really excited about installation art. Uh, oh, and so that that's where your, architecture. Cross, your crossover comes because of that. Well, then you went back to school again. I did. And I, <laughs> I went back and I got a master's degree in architecture. Was that hard to do after all those years? It was a relief. I mean, I've been wandering around so much, I've got to say that it kind of felt like I was getting my feet under me. Oh, you finally did. Well, then how, so you got your master's, then how'd you get to Frank's office, to Gary's office? Well, I, I was very fortunate. Uh, the master's program at UCLA is a three-year program. My first, my first year, I met Robert Mangurian. Oh, I love him. He became him. a mentor to me, and he was at the time working with James Terrell on the winery competition. And he introduced me to Frank's office. So my uh, second year, I, I was an intern at Frank's making models uh, uh, for the Walker Show. He had just gotten his Walker Show. Oh, with the big fish out in yeah. front. We yes. went to that. Yeah. We, <laughs> I didn't go. <laughs> I was too tired. <laughs> For making all those models, yeah. And then, I, and then after I finished uh, oh. my studies at UCLA, he hired me. That was great. And yeah. then you stayed for how, you, project, what is like a project manager? A project what designer. You, the designer, mm -hmm. what is that? Um, well, you work with Frank on the design. And at the time, the office was much smaller than it became. Uh, we were in Venice at Brooks, and I was there oh, at, in, right. in Venice, and then the, the move to Cloverfield, the move back to Cloverfield in Santa Monica. Uh, and um, I was there for just uh, maybe four and a half years. So you really have a great history. Yeah, you really I, do. I've you have been a very layered fortunate. history. <laughs> I mean, I've and had amazing mentors. Of course, Elise Grinstein was at Frank's for a while too. Not when I was there, but I met her. But she her. was before you. She was, uh huh. And then I met her through Frank. I mean, she would come. Right. And she's a good friend of his, and she'd wander around the office. And I remember the first time I saw it, this woman who must be like, I don't know, how tall is she? Four, six, yeah, four, right. eight, <laughs> and who went back to school to become an architect. And she had these leopard skin, three inch high heels on her. I thought, I like that lady. <laughs> so um, I met her there and then um, over time we, we got to know each other a little bit and then uh, I started my own practice and I was doing uh, art. I, had, I was working with Liz Larner. Do you know oh, that yes. she's an artist, Liz Larner, yes. uh, here? And we did some projects together. But I was always interested in, in bridging art and architecture and, and and, and in public art, in public scale, in public art that is architecturally scaled, you really get to do that. But and it's that's so difficult, isn't it? Mixing it, getting the art out to the people, having having um, the public approve of what you're doing. I mean, you work with. I see you came from a background where arts were part of the architecture, right? You came from a, a very heavy art background. You came from. Um, architectural firms who had artists coming and going all the time so they were continually thinking about art and bridging that gap right. and um, how do you do it how do you do that how do you do you do the architecture yourself and then do you bring the art into it or do you make the architecture an artistic statement I think that m that many architects have a similar process as artists do. When I first started doing this, there was more of a division and uh, even a bit of a, a bias. As a matter of fact, I was going after public art commissions and when people found out I was a licensed architect, um, there was you know, a little bit of- This is standoffish, I there think. There was, and, and it was hard to break in. Um, but things have changed now. I think people understand that there's, there's so much that overlaps. 
Um, and public art has become very integrated. It's not what they used to call plop art. Plop art. It should be integrated, like Cal State, uh, California State University of Fresno. You you did the library there. I did a um, what well, uh, an art commission for the library that was designed by AC Martin. AC Martin was the architect. Well, right. How did you integrate the art project? David called me and he had designed the library for Fresno that um, had, it had a, a part of it, a very um, symbolic gesture. It was a four-story cylindrical form that he called the basket because the native peoples of that area had, um, had the tradition of making these very meticulously crafted baskets. Oh. And the baskets for them were really so much part of their lives. They were born in the basket. Many of their homes were the basket. They cooked in the basket. They died in the basket. They were burned after they died in the basket. It was, they call it the, um, there's a, the code of the basket, as a matter really? of fact. And so he asked me, he invited me up to meet with the university and also with a woman from the local rancheria who was um, one of the last speakers of the native languages and talk to her, interview her, and asked me if I would do a piece there that somehow brought that culture and thinking about baskets, because that's how he had thought about it, into the library. Oh, I was fantastic. initially very drawn to the forms of these baskets. Yes, because, it, well, and his architecture shows that, doesn't it? Right. But as I, I thought more about it, I became most interested in the process of it. It was woman's work. The, the, the gathering and the drying of the baskets took an enormous amount of effort. The weaving of a large basket could take a year. And I started thinking of that as almost like those languages that are being lost. There are very few master weavers now. Oh, is that part of the installation? It is the installation, and it runs 24-7 on the library. It's three stories tall and oh, it, it shows every stitch of uh, the making talks, of that basket. It talks about the movement, and I didn't understand the what rhythm. the movement is. It's, it's the, the rhythm. rhythm, it's the rhythm. And another uh, international award you got was for this Studio 1452. Is mm -hmm. that totally different? It is, that's a commercial project about beauty. It's, it's for it's a It's beauty in the same kind of way, <laughs> but totally different. I guess another woman's project in a way, uh -huh. but it's for a German company um, who makes hair products, um, Goldwell and, and KMS, and um, we did their, their flagship salon and academy oh, and see. their corporate headquarters in Santa Monica. I see. And this? This is a project we did at Chapman University. It's a columbarium, and a columbarium uh, is it's a, a mausoleum for ashes, so people are interred there. It's in there, all faiths. Um, Nick adjacent to the All Faiths Chapel in their Fish Interfaith Center on their on, at and Chapman. How do you research something to, like that? Do they give you guidelines and tell you what they want? No. For something? No. This was another project that actually David Martin invited me to. He, he asked me if I'd be interested in doing the columbarium and the adjacent garden. On the garden. And I saw the poetry of those two spaces, the garden, and, and I created a garden of the senses just filled with herbs and, and, and things that you could touch and, and, and smell. And then the columbarium next to it, which is a place for, for the dead. But you're, what you're doing encounters so many different things. It's, that's true. It, That's true. And what, what you're talking about, I mean, um, the, the garden aspect of it, and then the working with an architect, and the art, and the researching the artistic part of things. When do you get to use your own architecture? Well, we also have architectural commissions. And, yeah, in, I and, see. Right, and so these are just the award-winning <laughs> things we're talking about. No, I no, I think that um, I mean this is a very architectural project because, in fact, you know we designed that columbarium as an architectural space. Oh, you did. It wasn't a Martin. I see. Right. I see. So, so there is a fusion, and I and I, that's what I love about it. That, in fact, as as we keep doing this, we have more opportunities. Do you find new materials to use? Physical materials, yes. Is that kind of an interesting part of your job as well? 
It is. Um, there are always new materials that are being made and exciting ways of using them. Of course, right. sustainability is so right. big now. <laughs> But the other thing that I'm very interested in, we started on this with the Fresno job, uh, and now we've, we've gone even deeper into it, is the relationship of media to architecture. So then we're working with, with things that are digital and the interface of that with architecture. And so that's almost, mid it, coming from my background as a sculptor, where oh, everything no. I was like pushing clay, to now we're, we're really in the ideas that in, in, in the material becomes information. And so it's, it's really quite, so quite that's a path. that's what we have to look for next. Yes. That's what we should be looking for. Yeah. Well, thank you for bringing <laughs> us uh, one new thing to look for. But also to see this interaction that mm -hmm. you've done. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. And thank you for watching the show. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa. 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. And don't forget to email J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com. See you next time.